What is up? Welcome to Etsy Jam, episode 79. Today, Richie and I talk in depth about long tail keywords. We cover questions like, what exactly are long tail keywords? Why should I use them in my shop? How do I find good long tail keywords? And how do I apply them to my listings? Stick around for some sweet long tail goodness on this episode of Etsy Jam. What is up? Welcome to Etsy Jam, the show where we have crazy conversations about serious topics. I am Gordon from Marmalade. And I am Richie from Marmalade. Now, if you have an Etsy shop that you're serious about and you don't yet know what Marmalade is all about, Marmalade gets your products found with real shopper keywords. And you can learn a lot more about Marmalade over at Marmalade.com. So check out Marmalade.com, which is M-A-R-M-A-L-E-A-D.com. And you don't even have to take our word for it. We have a testimonial this week from Connie. Connie says, I do not usually have a lot of time to be on my computer or to work on SEO. Lately, I cannot stop working on SEO with the new update. Uh, all I can say is, wow, thank you. I am loving the new update so much it is hard not to use it. I do not know all there is to know yet about it, uh, but what I do know is working great. I loved the old, and now I love the updated version even more. Great job, guys. Thank you, Connie. We wish you all the best in your selling. So what do we got? What are we talking about today, Richie? Well, today we're going to talk about long tail keywords, which is a, uh, let's just say a very misunderstood topic, right? Key, if keywords are a misunderstood topic, long tail just gets a little bit deeper into a little buzzword that gets thrown around a lot. And a lot of people aren't really sure what to make of them and how to use them. Uh, they're definitely valuable, but they can also lead you in the wrong direction. Mm, that reminds me of keyword stuffing being confusing, too. Ooh, good call. That's true. <laughs> keyword stuffing was very confusing. We should have talked about that one around Thanksgiving time. Oh, we should, we'll make a note of that. We'll, we'll hit that one again. Timeliness with the holidays. All right. So, yes, keyword, long tail keyword. What exactly is a long tail keyword so that we can make sure everyone is on the same page from the very beginning? I mean, we have keywords, and keywords are pretty much anything that people are going to be typing into a search bar to, you know, find your listings. And typically we're talking about keywords then in categories like are they broad keywords like jewelry or are they long tail keywords, which is really just another way of saying a more specific search phrase combination of multiple keywords, you know, like boho festival jewelry, right? That would be a more specific, a longer tail keyword. Um, and then you could get, you know, very hyper specific where you basically type out a whole phrase, right? So boho festival jewelry for people who like to go to loud music festivals. That would be a very long tail keyword, very, Super very specific. Tail. All right, so that's what long tail keywords are. So there are some other kind of qualities that go around long tail keywords. One of them is that fewer people are going to be searching them because they're more specific. So you have this balance of a lot of people can search jewelry. It's one word. It's very broad. You're casting a very wide net, but it's not very specific, right? What are we looking for? Something gold, silver, any other materials? Are we even talking, are we talking about bracelets, necklaces? What are we talking about here? Right? Very, very, very broad. Yeah. So your chance, go ahead. I was just going to say it comes to from um, people describing things in different ways. They could actually all be searching for the exact same thing, but be thinking of it in their own minds in different ways and describing it using different words. So it's kind of different angles that coming even the same product. Exactly. So regionally, you're going to see, you know, geographically, you're going to see uh, different people calling things by different words. That's just how it works. Uh, but the thing is, the more specific you're going to get, Jewelry, you're targeting, you know, very, very, you know, like I said, broad range. Uh, the chances of people searching that and then buying a listing based on that search is going to be very low just because it's so, so wide. and There's so much variety in the product, right? They're going to end up narrowing down that search, which is where you start getting into the longer tail keywords. And that's where it's going to be more likely if your listing is visible to those, you know, someone's actually likely to be a real shopper for it. Problem, though, is it's kind of a range. Right. On the one end where you have one keyword in the search phrase, super broad, a lot of activity on it, a lot of searches, very few purchases. On the far other end, it's super specific. There might be one person in the entire world that's going to type in this search and they haven't even done it yet. And you're just fingers crossed. That they're going to someday and they're going to find it and love it because it's so specific. So somewhere in the middle is that happy place where you actually want to find your keywords. And that's really where keyword research comes into play, 
You want something that is specific enough that people will search that. Uh, the results from that search are kind of like what their true choices are for what they're going to buy, but not so specific that you know there aren't enough people searching it for you to be visible. Yeah, it, it gets into a little bit of um, like the sales funnel kind of that we've talked about before too and people's shopping pattern. One of the things we did a, a long time ago was sat down with a handful of people and actually watched them shop on Etsy. And one of the people that uh, I did this with was uh, my friend Alex. And Alex was shopping for his wife, Sarah. He, he didn't know off the bat exactly what he wanted to get for her. I think he started with something like handmade, like super generic search just to get an idea of what are my options, you know. From there, he was like, oh, there's soap. Like, that's Sarah. I could get her some, like, soap. She'd probably like that. So then he gets into so searching for soap. And in doing so, obviously, there's different scents and things like that with those and he also finds that some people were selling variety packs and he's like well this is awesome because i don't even know exactly what type of you know smells she likes and which ones should be like oh, that doesn't sound so great so he was specifically looking for variety packs and now he's like pretty far down his search path and he's he's entering these much more specific phrases for what he's actually looking to purchase when he started with something super generic like you know handmade or even soap if he if he had started it that way you know watching other people do it sometimes is insightful like oh do i do that and then you notice that like you start doing things too but yeah. sometimes you don't notice like how your own behavior but a lot you know there's a lot of similarities between you know what we do and someone else does so what you do your shopper is also, not always, right? Some, sometimes you're not your shop, you're, you know, you're not your customer, but other times you're very much like your customer. We all have a lot of similar shopping behaviors, which is why, you know, Etsy spends so much time doing testing and different, you know, shopper experience type of things because they realize that a majority of shoppers do behave very, very, very similar. Yeah, and the actual the behavior of searching using long tail keywords is kind of being rewarded across the board. It starts with Google and, you know, the more words you give Google describing what you're looking for, the more accurate their results for you as a searcher are going to be. And the same thing is going to be true of Amazon and Etsy and any other place that you're going to search. The more information that the shopper can provide to straight to the search engine for what they're looking for, the better they can find matches and provide those back to the consumer um, if it's an e-commerce website or to the searcher if it's like a, a Google or a Bing kind of deal. But that activity, when whenever you do something and you get a positive reward back, you're going to keep doing that. And so people are really being trained that the better I can describe things and, and the more information I can put in here easily and quickly, the less junk I kind of have to wade through and look at the stuff that I'm not really interested in finding. Completely agreed with that. It's almost like, you know, using more specific words like that or specific phrases, like you said, it's kind of like doing a filter before applying the filters. It's filtering at the search level. It's saying, ah, okay, these are what are best fit and use this word. So we're not going to include these other ones. The other thing the reason, well, the reason that works is since it's like a filter, your direct competition for those keywords is going to be lower too, right? Because there are less listings that are going to be using those words, you know, when it gets more specific like that. And so you want lower competition because your chance, your visibility, the way that Etsy cycles you through to shoppers and search is just going to be more rapid if you have less direct competition. Of course, there's always that caveat, right? You get like we talked about. You don't want to be so specific that hardly anybody's searching it, because if that's the case, then you're no better off than if you use just a super broad keyword like jewelry actually might be worse off because at least then you have an opportunity to be cycled through all of that high volume of shoppers and have a shot there. But if you're targeting things that are so specific that no one's searching it, well, then you have just about zero chance of being seen. Until they someday maybe do. Yes. Someday. <laughs> somebody will be born. And they will be destined to search that keyword and to find that listing and to purchase it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Still waiting. <laughs> yeah, it's just like Richie's saying, there's that happy medium in there. And that's, that's where you really want to be trying to find yourself for your long tail keywords. You don't want to find something that nobody is searching for or that you're going to have to wait a month for somebody to search for. Take that into consideration when, you, when you're searching for your keywords. And how do you know when, you know, how do I know when the engagement is, is in a good range, whether it's high enough for me for my long tail keyword or whether I just have to settle for, you know, two bars or whatever, three bars, whatever it ends up being in Marmalade. The only way to know that is by doing those searches inside of Marmalade and, and comparing them and starting to get a feel for that market. 
because every market's going to be different, right? We're kind of talking about this before the jam. It depends what you're selling and it depends how many people are in there searching for it and what that landscape looks like and what words they're using to describe it. If you are selling Boho Festival jewelry, that's going to be very different than selling slime on Etsy uh, or Harry Potter slime, I think was the example Richie gave uh, when we were chatting before the jam. So yeah, Harry Potter, Harry Potter and slime is so hot right now on Etsy. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Those have consistently been up there. Uh, Yeah. So if you're comparing keywords that revolve around Harry Potter and slime to keywords that revolve around rustic wall sconces, you might have the very best keywords for rustic wall sconces, but they're not going to be as good as the keywords for Harry Potter slime. Right. Now, of course, the keywords for rustic wall sconces are going to be better for rustic wall sconces than if you called your rustic wall sconce Harry Potter slime, that's not going to go over well. But, you know, that's where it's more art than science, right? You have to know what's in that market. And when we say better keywords, too, we're talking strictly in terms of searches and engagement. Some of those keywords like slimers are going to have crazy high competition also, which might make them, in fact, like not great keywords. But we're just kind of talking in terms of engagement level because it's easy to just focus on that one portion. So other long tail keyword things. Other long tail keyword facts. Well, something else is very important to realize because it's common to look on Etsy do a search, take a look at what, you know, what listings are popping up for search and then go and see if those are selling for the shop. And if they are, then we think that, oh, because that listing popped up in search for me and this, these listings are selling, these, this keyword must be doing it. But that's not true. It could be true, but it, it depends. <laughs> it really depends, right? Another kind of more art than science. We can't go search on Etsy for a long tail keyword. Look at those listings. Say, hey, this has a lot of views, and then assume it's a good keyword. Because actually, the more specific that keyword is, the less likely those views actually came from it. Uh, the reason being, all these different listings that we see on Etsy, let's say it has 5,000 views. It has 5,000 views, or we could say visits, either one, views or visits, regardless of which metric you're looking at. They're coming from multiple different places. That is just a sum total of where those are coming from. Now, you might have typed in one of these really long search phrases that for the very first time were ever typed into Etsy, but Etsy's going to throw results back at you because that's how it works. And then you clicked it and you viewed it. And now they're going to be able to see that they got found for this keyword. And that seller might think that, oh my gosh, someone found me for this. This must be a good keyword. I'm going to use it. But that might be the only time that anyone was ever going to type that keyword in, that very long tail specific phrase. And all the other views are coming from other keywords. Now, don't get me wrong, they're going to come from other keywords that have been typed for the first time, but might not be repeated. Some of them will, some of them won't, right? So if you look in your shop stats and see what keywords are bringing in views, you probably see a bunch in there that are one time. Even if you look at a long history, you probably see a bunch in there. You've been found for them one time, just one. That's probably because they're just really low volume. I want to jump in real quick here too. And we've had some kind of comments on, on our, through our support channels and stuff like that that lead us to believe that people aren't always going into their Etsy stats to look at their listings. And specifically what Richie is talking about here, when you go into your Etsy shop and you go to manage your listings and you go to any one of those listings, you can see stats specific to that listing. This is a, it's a really important thing to know how to do this. And it's a very important thing to actually take the time to do it on your listings because this is the best way to measure whether your keywords are working for you. You can't look at where you're ranking. You can't look at sales. I mean, you can look at sales, but you're going to get more information from this than you will from your sales numbers. So it's a very important thing to know how to do and to actually do it. You're going to want to go into your Etsy stats and go to your listing specific stats. So pick any one of your listings and go in there and then you're going to scroll down. There's a bunch of different stats that Etsy shows you for each one of your listings. If you scroll down, there's a section there that shows you your keywords that you have been found for. So somebody typed in this keyword, they searched the keyword, they you showed up and they clicked on your listing for this keyword. And this is the best way to keep track of changes that you've made to your keywords and seeing if they're actually working for you or not. Because this data is straight from Etsy and they're feeding it right back to you as a seller and letting you know what keywords are working best for you. That's really good. That fits right along with it. That's the thing, right? Like and when you look there, you know that's where they're coming from. You So then you actually know whether or not this keyword's working for you, which is even more important because just because something's working for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. That's really important to know as well. Yes. But without seeing someone else's stats, right? Like, so if you had a friend 
on Etsy and they were sharing their stats with you and you were seeing what keywords are working for them and you're selling the same thing and you're seeing what's actually bringing them in from the stats, you know, that's where they're coming from. That's one thing. But if you're just looking, if you just type it in, you're like, Hey, well, they popped up for the search. I was able to find them there. They have 5,000 visits on their listing. They, you know, it must, this must be a good keyword. No, that's the very first time anyone's ever used that. Their other visits all came from social media and from promoted listings and this, these other, like this other handful of keywords, uh, which is where they're coming from. So I guess what we're really trying to say is we don't want you to think someone else is seeing success from a particular keyword without any basis for it and then run off and waste your time trying to use that keyword only to later be like, I don't know what's going on. This isn't working. That's kind of the long and short of it. What do we do about though? So we've talked a lot about it. So I, I feel like we've talked a lot about, a lot about what not to do but we need to talk about what to do. One of the things about these long tails is you're pretty much going to get found for them anyway if you're doing your keywords right. These one-off searches, these very specific ones, these very low volume ones, like we said, they have lower direct competition. They are longer phrases of the keywords you should be actually targeting. So again, if you can imagine that line where it's very broad keywords to very specific keywords, and you're targeting the ones in that happy spot in the middle, when you're doing that right, and your shoppers are typing those very specific ones, Etsy's going to look at your listings too. And they're going to say, oh, if I put these keywords together, it's a pretty good fit for this very specific one. And then you get thrown into that pool and you get viewed for it anyway. But you also get the benefit of the search volume that's coming from the keywords you're actually targeting in that, you know, that happy middle spot. Yeah, and you can see this in action, too. Again, I'm going to tie this back to Etsy stats. If you go look at that table on your listings and you see that there's keywords in there that you don't have in your title and you don't have in your tags, those exact word for word keywords. And you're thinking, well, how the heck does this work, right? Doesn't, I mean, I need to match my title and tags to strongly attract people who are shopping for a certain keyword. How am I getting views from this keyword that's totally different here? This is, this is that exact thing happening. This is how Etsy operates. It doesn't have to be a one-for-one -one match all of the time. Now, if you do have a one-for-one -one match with what they're typing in, that's fantastic. It gives you a much better relevancy score, and so you're, you're going to have a better chance of getting uh, a view from that search. But you can, you can see by looking at those keywords that Etsy shows you in your listing stats table and track those back to the individual keywords that you're using, how those can loosely match up together. And you can get some of these kind of like accidental, maybe you could call them, um, hits from keywords that you're not directly targeting in your title or your tags, but you can see how they're kind of derivative of them. They're related to them. They're made up of similar words to them. And so Etsy is pulling your listing back because it was such a good match for those keywords, even though they're not a uh, one for one exact letter to letter match. Right. Use those exact one to one letter matches for the more competitive keywords yes. that you're explicitly targeting. Right. And when you do well there, then the, those other ones are just going to come along with it. And that's kind of the secret to it. That's really how it works. So kind of the goal in one sentence is to choose keywords that are specific enough to be targeted to a potential shopper, yet not so specific that no one is searching them. And if you can do that, then you win. Tell them what they've won, Richie. They have won search engine success oh, on Etsy. I was hoping for like a trip to Hawaii or something, man. No, this is better. They can buy a trip to Hawaii <laughs> with their search engine success. <laughs> there you go. I mean, once you start getting found in search, once you get this stuff locked down, I mean, people are just going to be finding you 24-7. Your shoppers, not just people, right? Which is even better. Not just people. You don't want just people finding you. You want your shoppers, your customer, your potential customer finding you. And we all use search as our go-to. That's where we start. Yeah. When we have an idea, we start with search. We want to buy something specific. We start with search. So that's where you really need to get found. Even people that get pulled into Etsy from clicking an ad on Facebook or Pinterest or, or wherever, a certain percentage of the time, they're not going to be making a direct purchase off of that. They're going to be doing another search on Etsy. Like, oh, wow, this is a really funny T-shirt. I wonder what other funny T-shirts Etsy has here. Like, let me do a search for it, you know? Agreed. 
Most people don't just do one search. Most people do multiple searches. What else do we got? Um, I would say also with long tail keywords, you kind of want to have, again, it's going to be a balance. So we talked about the balance of uh, level of engagement for the keywords and that what, what's good engagement wise and finding your happy spot there. You're going to want to find a happy spot of how many long tail keywords to include in your listing. Um, I wouldn't suggest necessarily packing every single one of your tags with a long tail keyword it could make sense in some situations to use shorter tail keywords i guess like normal keywords in some of those tag spots and stuff like that and then this goes back to how people are searching for things and you know your long tail version hopefully is being hit by a significant number of people but like we were saying people have different ways of describing things so let's say some people swap in a word here, swap out a word there. Instead of saying beaded boho festival necklace, they search for beaded boho festival jewelry. Well, if you include jewelry as one of your tags, you're you're probably going to have a tough time, you know, getting views and sales from that keyword directly just because of the nature of how competitive that space is. But by doing that, somebody who searches for beaded boho festival jewelry, you are now pretty good consideration for that because you've included a lot of those same keywords in your listing. And so in including that extra jewelry tag, you can attract some of those other searches that are similar to your long tail searches, but maybe they've included the word jewelry in place of, you know, necklace or anklet or bracelet or whatever um, other descriptor you have there for that. We now interrupt your regularly scheduled broadcast to bring you the last Easter egg in April, which is a Cinco de Mayo sombrero. Anything else? Anything else on long tails you want to call out the only other thing that i would think of mentioning too but we had a comment in the facebook group where someone was saying how they wanted to basically check our numbers and see if they matched up with etsy and like we've encouraged them to do right go to etsy type a letter into the search bar and then all of the words that etsy is suggesting search those in marmalade and they're going to be high search high engagement for you well they went to go do this but they kind of did it wrong they, they typed in like their entire keyword phrase into the search bar and it showed up as a suggestion, uh, which means that somebody somewhere on Etsy has searched it, but not necessarily a bunch of people. And then when they came into Marmalade to check, they were seeing that like the numbers were low and they're like, well, it's in the search bar, but the numbers here are low. And the whole idea is obviously like, well, yeah, the more letters you type into Etsy, the more specific you're getting with the keyword that you're targeting. So the less people are going to be typing in those exact letters in that exact order. You know what I mean? So naturally, you're, as you put longer stuff in there, you're going to be getting back less engagement, less searches from those, you know? And it's kind of related yeah. in that, like, it's it's long tail, sort of like long tail stuff, because you're typing in longer phrases in the search bar. But at the same time, I'd hesitate to include it just because I don't want to, like, it's kind of, it's a little tangential, and it doesn't necessarily help. Agreed. So, I mean, you can kind of think of that, like, when you were saying about, you know, typing everything, like a whole thing into the search bar. If the search bar is playing a game and they are trying to guess what you're, you know, they're trying to complete your phrase with guesses, it's kind of like when you're playing a game and you start with a bunch of blanks and you're like, is there an A? And then they're like, no, no A. Is there an O? And then like, oh, there's a couple of them. As it fills in, at some point, just about anybody walking by can be like, oh, that's that word, you know, because almost all the letters are filled in. But at some point, I'm really bad at this game, by the way, but, it, you know, at some point, there's like three letters and some people can look at it and they can complete the word. But that's what it makes me think of like it. At some point, if it's just missing like a Y on the end. OK, that wasn't so hard. And when you're typing in like almost the entire search, like keyword into the search bar, that's what makes me think like, wow, you gave them a lot of hints. All right. Well, very good. That's long tail keywords in 30 minutes or less. There you go. That's a, probably a new podcast record. I wanted to announce, too, that this is the last jam for April. And if you have been a loyal jam subscriber and been following along and playing our Easter eggs game with us, this is the last jam day in April. So shoot us an email at success at marmalade.com with the Easter eggs you found in the month of April to be up for a very exciting prize, which we will probably announce at the beginning of uh, May's jams. But there you go. 
the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that these jams that we have, however you're listening to them or watching them now, we have them in different formats. They live over at Marmalade.com. You can find them on our blog if you prefer to read. We also have them on YouTube if you are more of a visual type person. And if you are consuming them that way but you didn't know that there's a podcast, there's a podcast, too. So you can listen inside of iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, any of your favorite music players and uh, consume them that way, too. Jade also goes through uh, and scoops out the most relevant and interesting parts in each of the jams. Oftentimes a very difficult and arduous task to try to find value in these things, but she does a great job of it. And those go over to YouTube also as much shorter clips, and they get linked in through the blog post. So if you don't have time to sit down through uh, one of the longer jams, but you still want to kind of get some of the good highlights out, you can head over there and listen through just the scoops, we call them. If you would like to be a guest on Etsy Jam, we would love to hear from you. Shoot us an email again at success at marmalade.com. We would love to have you on the show. All right. We will see you guys next time on Etsy Jam.